I'm Chris Lord Brown. And I'm Jonathan Harty. Together we run Lord Brown and Harty Funeral Directors in North Wales. Uh, we are here today to talk about working in the funeral profession, working with grief and loss. Welcome to The Silent Why, a podcast exploring the patterns of hope in amongst loss and grief. I'm Claire Sands. And I'm her husband, Chris. And we're on Loss 43 out of 101 as we chat to people who've experienced or work with many kinds of grief. In this episode, we get to chat to two guests who both undertake work in an area that I find particularly fascinating. And I've wanted to have people like this on as guests since we started the podcast. Funeral directors. Or you may know them as good old-fashioned undertakers. In general, funeral directors are, are looked at in a sort of an unpopular way. You know, we are a necessary evil. There's no getting away from that. What people don't realise is that we may have been up all night dealing with a road traffic accident, you know, or something awful. And then we come in and try and look our best for the other families that we're dealing with. Meet Chris and Jonathan, who run a funeral home in North Wales. Both have worked in the profession for around three decades, but despite absolutely loving what they do, the disturbing nature of their work can leave its scars. If you can think of a mode of death, we've dealt with it, we've seen it. They're not the things that really bother me. It's the effect that it has on the families and seeing them struggle and the emotional toll that it has on them. Yeah, we've both had our demons. Bereavement doesn't just affect those we look after, it affects us. And lots of the people we look after, we know. And that's kind of hard, and it's cost me relationships, freedoms. It's cost an awful lot psychologically as well. They share with us what it's like working in a 24-7 on-call job, dealing with people who are very fresh into their grief, why Jamie Oliver visits regularly, and what place Hope has in the funeral business. What gets me through the day is having the opportunity to make a difference, to to make a a real difference to the families that we come into contact with. If I do my job correctly and as diligently as I should do, then at the end of that initial process, I should be able to say, yes, I did make a difference there. After listening to this conversation, you may never see an undertaker in the same way again. So here they are to introduce themselves. I'm Chris Lord Brown. I'm a funeral director here in Llandidno in North Wales. I've been a funeral director since 1996. Alongside Jonathan, my colleague, we run our funeral directors, Lord Brown and Harty Limited. He's of no use after that whatsoever. That's it. (laughs) My name's Jonathan Harty. I'm a funeral director. I work in Llandidno with my colleague Chris, who you've just heard from. I've been a funeral director for over 30 years. Uh, I can't think of another way of life. Jonathan, starting with you, take us back to something near the beginning of of your time as a funeral director. Uh, I I noted on your website that both of you started out progressing down a teaching route. So at some point you decided no to the teaching and yes to funeral directorship, if that's even a word. How, How did that come about? I sort of fell into teaching, really. I didn't know what to do for a degree. I wasn't particularly bright at school. I did fine, but um, I didn't really know what to do. And I ended up doing teacher training for year B. Ed. Started teaching and then realised that teaching is for some people and not for others. It was quite. Uh, you, you're very young when you start. You're very young, and I was teaching secondary school. Some of the sixth form kids were two or three years younger than me. It's a huge thing to have to stand there looking really young with hair that I haven't got now and teach these kids. And, and you soon realize that this is not the job for me. And I was I was in Warrington and I wanted to come home to North Wales. I missed missing the mountains. I missed the family. I wanted to come home. Um, came home and um, didn't know what to do. Anyway, I was offered a job to cover somebody at a, a funeral directors that we both worked for for a long time. And just stayed. I was there for 29 years. It just became a, a, a way of life. It, it is in my family. My great great grandfather, great great uncle were both funeral directors. But it wasn't something that I ever thought I wanted to do. I just sort of fell into it. And you, uh, you naturally realise that actually I quite enjoy this as hard as it can be. I do really enjoy helping people. 
and and 30 years later I'm still still doing it before I ask Chris the same question those words you said and I just stayed there must have been something that grabbed you that you thought ah I like this can you remember what what that was it's very stressful this job especially when you're quite young if you're quite young in the funeral business families have a lot of uh, trust issues with you so you walk into into a home full of people where someone has passed away and you look very young and it's hard for young funeral directors you know it's it's hard to have that um gravitas that you get when you get old and gray but people were very kind and very supportive and and i felt like this is what i'm meant to do once you start to deal with families you become part of someone's family for a couple of weeks and it, it it's almost like a drug really you you can't help yourself it's i've got to help these people if you become addicted to it it's like i'm quite good at this i i can help people why would i want to do anything else and it's been like that for a long long time lovely to hear chris your turn similar story very different story some parallels there i i grew up in nottingham uh, my family is still down there and i was very involved in music from a very early age instrumental playing um, and in my younger years i really wanted to become a professional musician that's kind of where i thought i was headed and as the years went by and I sort of completed training and so on and so forth, it became clear that there's a big difference between being a good musician and being good enough to make a living. And there's quite a distinction between the two. And um, I kind of thought making a living as a professional musician is going to be very tough. So there tends to be a sort of natural progression in that world that if you're not quite good enough to earn a living as a professional and then you teach so I'd done a bit of instrumental teaching whilst I was at school and college and naturally went down the route of becoming a classroom teacher so I did my teach training in and around Manchester like Jonathan I did a, a four-year B.Ed as it was at the time and probably in short when I started the course, I was too naive. And when I finished the course, I was far too cynical. And it, it became clear, really, that had I have chosen to leave the profession, that the world wasn't going to lose one of its greatest educators. And my heart really wasn't in it. At the end of the course, I relocated to North Wales. And I got to know Jonathan. And the company that he was working for at the time, which, as he said, we subsequently both worked for for a long time, one of the family members was retiring, so there was a hole there that needed to be filled. I'd put myself on the teaching supply list, sort of half-heartedly, really, not with any particular intention of pursuing it seriously, but, you know, I need to make a living somehow. So the opportunity came up as I was doing that to work in the funeral directors, and really that, that was it. And straight away, I, I knew that this was for me. And it, it was such a stark contrast to how I felt going into a classroom and standing in front of a classroom full of children, to working in the funeral profession and the sense of satisfaction, the sense of worth that I got and felt and still do from working in the funeral profession was markedly different to classroom teaching. So I never looked back from there. And you obviously set up your own business together after that. So how does it feel working together at that level rather than just kind of being colleagues in, a, in the other firm? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting and quite a long story, really. Uh, we were both, as I say, worked for this local company for decades. We were put in a position where we had to leave, which we did, and set our own company up. And we, we'd worked together for so long that, you know, we know each other inside out, really. Um, so it was a, a sort of fairly easy progression from being work colleagues and employed to owning the company and working together in, in that capacity as well. It has worked really well so so far, incredibly well. In fact, um, I, I'm still shocked every day uh, as I drive into work. And, we, you know, you look at the beautiful bay in Clandidno as we come over the hill and you think to myself, can't believe I'm in this position. You know, I'm, I'm in charge of my own destiny. The only person I can blame is myself. Uh, but other people are reliant on me. You know, the people we employ, Chris is as reliant on me as, as I am on, uh, on him. Yeah, it's it's a different different way of life, 
but I absolutely love it. It's changed everything. It's changed everything. And it's enabled us to do some of the things that we weren't able to do when we worked for someone else. Things that were a huge um, mountain to climb back then are nothing now because we just say, yes, yeah, of course we can do that. Not, I've got to check with owners. We just say, yes, it's fine. We, we don't have set hours. You know, we just work, which is great for us. Not so great for our families, but um, it's great for us. It's a huge change. When I was looking at your website, what struck me about it was the phone number has after it 24 hours a day. Yeah. There's not a lot of businesses that have to, to run like that all the time on one phone number. So I guess it's quite a hidden away world what you do in some ways. And it's for, for us or for me, I find it fascinating. So just paint a picture of what an average, if there is an average day, looks like. What kind of things are you doing? The short answer is we do all of it. We cover on call 24 hours at the moment. We sort of alternate days and, and weekends, but one of us will always answer the phone, be that three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon. So if we were called in the early hours, typically we could be, depending on the circumstances, we could be out for two, three or more hours, depending on the complexity of what we're going to. So quite often we may have very little sleep and we're still in the office at 9 o'clock in the morning, um, carrying on with a day that already would have been pre-planned. So yes, we, we look after everything from the first call, from the initial phone call that we may receive from a family. We are on call for the coroner. So we deal with any sort of sudden or unexpected deaths, whether that be in home or accidents and so on and so forth. So we deal with all that as well. And during our typical working hours, our regular working hours, we are dealing with families, arranging appointments to arrange funerals, taking funerals, um, going to the hospitals to collect people and bring them back into our care and all the preparation and so on that is surrounding that. So really every every facet of the funeral from the very first call to taking the funeral at the end of that process, we, we deal with all of it. And we run a business as well and all of that entails, <laughs> you know, dealing with accountants and, and all the other stuff that um the boring bit really but we, we've we've coped with that quite well in fact uh, i'm convinced that you can run a business these days from your telephone it's not like it used to be it's a lot easier to do all of that book work and accountancy can all be done via apps is there any common or really frustrating misunderstandings that you find that you either have to or want to correct people when they assume stuff about your roles things are changing but in general funeral directors are are looked at in a sort of an unpopular way. You know, we are a necessary evil. There's no getting away from that. And until you've dealt with a good funeral director and your attitude changes, most people think, oh, look at them. You know, they drive big black cars around. They wear nice suits. They, they've they got all these things. And that's all it is. What people don't realize is that we may have been up all night dealing with a road traffic accident, you know, or something awful that has happened to a family and then we come in and try and look our best for the other families that we're dealing with that day but there's still this attitude that you find that oh funeral directors are kind of looked down on they're not appreciated as much as uh, many other professions and until you've looked after a family that that attitude tends to stay and then the way they look at you the way they think about you changes dramatically when you've helped them and and, and I'm under no illusions that we do anything more than help you on that first step. We just do the practical things that you can't do in the in the depth of your grief. We help you. We do those. We, we carry you for a few weeks, and and all we really do is 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 enable you to or carry that burden and enable you to to start your grieving process. Whatever type of funeral you have, it's just that public goodbye, isn't it? It's that the hard work starts after that the grieving, the loneliness. We're just lucky to be able to be in a situation to practically help families, support them at a time where the smallest of things that you would do naturally without thinking become massive hurdles because bereavement's like that. Grief is like that. It's it's very, very difficult. The interesting thing is so many families remember you. You know, you may have done a funeral for them 30 years ago. And then when another member of the family dies, they they seek you out, regardless of where you are, they seek you out. And a lot of people you still keep connections with, you still have this social connection, uh, you're part of 
You're part of the locality. You're part of the town. You, you're part of the firmament as a funeral director. And that's that's a huge, huge privilege. It really is. Yeah, that's uh, quite an interesting observation, really, that although we are initially there to help for those for the first few weeks, we frequently find that you form relationships with people which last for years and years. Not only does that show itself in people coming back to you in in future when they've had another bereavement, but when you see them in a different setting, when you see people in a different setting, you may have helped five, six, seven plus years ago. And there's that instant sort of connection there because we come into people's worlds at their lowest ebb, at the lowest time. And very often people have no idea what they need to be doing, what they need to be thinking about. We're fortunate that we can come in and we can help them through that. And, And they remember that and we remember them. It's nice when you bump into somebody months down the line, years down the line, and it's as if you'd just seen them yesterday. And uh, it, it really is sort of heartwarming, if that's the right phrase, that um, we have those connections with the people that we deal with. My wife won't come shopping with me because it takes too long, because you're constantly stopping to speak to people, you're constantly bumping into people you've looked after. I want to speak to them. They're part of your life. There's no hiding from that. Just today, I, I nipped to get some lunch from the local supermarket and bumped into five families that I've looked after in the past and and it takes a lot longer thankfully I was waiting for a prescription so it filled the time which is which is nice but that happens all the time my wife just says no if you're going shopping go on your own (laughs) it's fascinating because you're there for these families at a time when a lot of people would probably find it very awkward to to be around them and speak to them so a lot of people we speak to especially when it's been a really horrific bereavement or a child or something like that they say one of the things they found is that friends and families colleagues they don't really know what to say to them or people have avoided them completely but you're right in the heart of that situation that a lot of people fear do you think that you're comfortable around grief have you got to the point of that just being so natural for you that you you always feel comfortable or is it because it's so different with grief you're still a bit like going into it thinking I don't know how I'm going to be with this one because some people react very differently everybody's different everybody is bringing their own sort of experiences or their own attitudes to to death and the death that they are currently going through whatever that may be and whatever the circumstances are which alters their behavior and how they are so so when I go to meet a family for the first time I may have spoken to them on the phone initially fairly briefly sometimes so I'm always a, a little bit guarded as to how are they going to be and really you you take your lead from them and quite often people are very open and they very welcoming and and you know yeah this is going to be fine sometimes people just don't want to engage because it's the last thing they want to be doing and we're turning up and we're the reality check that they have to deal with this yes we've been doing it for so long that we've you know come across every sort of imaginable reaction that you could think of but you don't quite know which one you're going to each time we get another family to help so initially very sort of guarded just to sort of assess the situation and then see how we go you've kind of you've developed this sort of game face because there is a a, a nervousness when you first meet a family especially when it's a tragic situation particularly tragic situation but also it does affect you. You can put this game face on, but it does affect you. But you can't let you can't let families see that. You can't let them feel that there's any anything but strength from your part. Both of us suffer from PTSD. I don't think Chris would would mind saying that. We've both attended awful, awful things that no one should ever have to see, and we're very protective of those coming into the business who potentially will have to see those things. So we would rather go to a scene like that ourselves than than let someone less experienced or newer to the business have to to deal with that and that's not good for them because we're we're overly protective really but but yeah we we are like swans in a way even on the day of the funeral that we look as calm as we possibly can be but underneath you you're paddling away worrying about every single aspect just wanting to make things work for for this family that you've spent so much time with, that you've become part of their family. You just want to make it work. And yeah, we've both had our D 
demons. Bereavement doesn't just affect those we look after, it affects us. And lots of the people we look after, we know. Lots of the families we know, lots of the people who passed away, we know. And that's kind of hard, and it's cost me relationships, being a funeral director. It's cost me lots of things, lots of things. Um, freedoms, you know, our freedoms are, are taken away because we are there for other people. It's cost, it's cost an awful lot psychologically as well. Years ago, when I first started, there was very little support. So we would attend a scene with fire crew, police officers, ambulance crew, and they would all be debriefed, and we would then attend a post-mortem, and then go back to the office and have a cup of tea and deal with the next family. And, and whilst everybody was being helped out who worked for emergency services, we are left to try and deal with those issues ourselves. And that's hard because you compartmentalize them. Well, I certainly do. You put them away and then they just appear just to surprise you every so often. So we suffer a kind of grief as well. And all funeral directors go through that. You have to be pretty hard not to be affected by, by those losses. How do you deal with it? What are the things that you can manage? What are the things that others can help manage to be able to process and almost release that burden from you rather than carrying one death after another with you? you know, I find that it's not the obvious things that affect me. For, from an outsider's point of view, you'd, you'd expect that some of the sights that we see will be the things that will keep you awake at night. And if you can think of a mode of death, we've dealt with it, we've seen it. They're not the things that really bother me. It's the effect that it has on the families and seeing them struggle and the emotional toll that it has on them and being part of that and then trying to help sort of guide them through that initial part of the process and, and watch them struggle. And, and, and that's what I find tough sometimes. And I, and I found as I get older, I become a bit more emotional about things as well, which is something I've noticed over the last few years. Um, when, I, you know, when I was a lot younger, I was kind of yeah, put it all away, lock it away in that little box and carry on with with your day and whatever else you're doing. But as I've got older, things affect me more. And um, there are sort of certain things that I find affect me on a funeral. When I'm so invested in getting this right for a family, there's a massive sense of relief and satisfaction when everything goes right into the process. When you know that everything has gone exactly how that family wanted it to go, there's a huge sort of outpouring of relief and emotion that that's gone fine because the lead up to that and on the day itself and going through the funeral itself is so stressful because there are so many things that can go wrong <laughs> there are so many things that can throw you off course that a lot of them you've got absolutely no control over and you and if those things happen you've kind of got to deal with it and go with it and get back on track you know i particularly get very emotionally invested with families that I'm helping. And I think that's true really for most funeral directors. You know, you do form a connection, you do form a bond. As far as dealing with it is concerned, I'm probably not the best person to ask that, probably the best person to ask or the best people to ask with my family. And they will probably say, well, actually you don't deal with it very well. Yeah. I try not to go home and kick the dog. <laughs> Listening to you talk it very much makes me think of uh, like a Sherpa in terms of like climbing Everest that a Sherpa being someone that comes alongside, that helps with the route, that carries some of the weight, that will be a sort of companion along this climbing of a mountain. But then the Sherpa doesn't get to stand at the top and sort of celebrate the achievement or the end. They just sort of quietly disappear and go and do it again with somebody else. Yeah, because really what, what you just said then about quietly stepping away, that's absolutely right. Once that funeral is underway and we've guided people to that point, we should be quietly stepping away and letting the family deal with things how they want to deal with things on a day um, and afterwards as well. Certainly big things that do affect me, particular pieces of music. You know, music is incredibly emotional attachment to, to people and, you know, it's a real trigger of emotion. You know, that's why it's part of the whole process and it appears so much in a funeral. And there are certain sort of music tracks that I think, oh, when I see them oh god i'm going to get through this you know because there's certain things that obviously are personal to me as well and when i see them coming along i think oh crikey and my 
sort of go-to way of dealing with everything is biting the inside of my mouth I bite the inside of my lip and you know chomp down on it until it's absolute agony and it kind of brings you back in line yeah it's a very emotional process i was just thinking about about that we were always sort of led to believe that the funeral director should never be seen crying you know or emotional they have to be this sort of stoic figure and i quite quickly learned that no you know this is affecting me as well I, i'm I'm invested in this. I feel for this family. I feel like crying. I'm going to cry. And it's such a natural response. There's a saying that says, live your life so well that when you die, even the funeral director cries. And and I, and I kind of understand that now. The, the thing is that, that that grief can hit you. It takes over you and you can't control what's going to happen to you. So perhaps in a different way, when I lost my father, I helped carry his coffin in with his friends into into church. And um, as I was walking in, we were carrying the coffin, I could hear someone wailing. And I mean really wailing, broken sort of howls. And it, it troubled me all the way through the funeral. And as, as, as we walked out of the church, I, I said to one of his friends, my father's friends, did you hear that person wailing? And he said, yeah, it was you. And I didn't, it, the grief hits you that way, doesn't it? It just sort of takes you out of where you are, takes everything away. And, and just this natural outpouring comes. And, and I've been on funerals, funerals for friends that I've been looking after, families that I know really well. You can't help but just get upset with them. And first of all, I was quite fearful of their reaction, but they soon realized that they, they see you then as a, a normal human being who's suffering with them. Some days you'll come in from work and there is nothing left. And that's really hard for people. That's really hard for people. You spend all day giving every part of support that you can to families and you come in and and there's nothing left. Yeah, it's quite it's quite hard for those who are with you and it's hard on you on yourself as well. But these days it's a lot easier. And like Chris said, getting older changes your perspective you're able to sort of understand why you feel that way. It reminds me of something you see on social media quite often, or I do at the moment, because I follow a lot of accounts that are looking at grief. And it says, just because you carry it so well doesn't mean it's not heavy. Absolutely. We've interviewed a a murder detective and a paediatric intensive care nurse, both about working around loss and death. And they've both said similar things, which has really highlighted to me that things that people might say to them around the idea that just because you've got a job you love doesn't mean you're able to cope with the loss and the grief that you're encountering every day any better than any other human would, especially the the nurse. She said, you know, there's this sort of maybe attitude of, well, you kind of chose it. You you know that sick kids isn't going to end well every day, so you probably know how to cope with that. I couldn't do it, and they kind of stepped back. And the the murder detective, very similar to you, said that he'd, he'd been to a lot of nasty things and then he had his father's funeral and halfway through the eulogy just completely lost it and had never shown any emotion and he felt that was just a build-up of all that he dealt with and Mm, I think they have these sort of they all have different coping strategies the police have this sort of dark humor they were talking about that actually helps them release that seriousness of what they do is there something amongst funeral directors is there a way of you releasing that stress in some way do you have a dark sense of humor do you have anything else going on that helps with that yeah, there's a, there's an awful lot of dark humour. Probably the darkest. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't forget, we work with the police all the time. We work with fire crews. We work with ambulance crews. So, so we're all very much the same. You know, we've got this this is this kind of bravado that you put on. But like I said earlier, that's the game face. It really is. If you didn't get affected by what you did, what you do, some of the things you see then it's time for you to stop being a funeral director. I think it's quite easy to to step over that line and become callous, become hardened, and then that doesn't help the families that you're with. That lack of understanding, the not prepared to give as much time as you possibly can to them, that I'm, I'm too busy, I've got to go and do something else, is a trait that I see in an awful lot of funeral directors who've been doing it for a long time. And, you know, I've always said to Chris, if you ever see me become like that, then I need to change my job and just wash the cars. Because the day it stops affecting you is the day you need to pack it in. Yeah, a lot of female directors don't help themselves because 
for some, it is nothing but a profit-making exercise. And they lose sight, if they ever had it, of why they are there in the first place. And you know, we are there to help. And we are there to, as Jonathan said, to start them on that initial journey and help them in those first few weeks. But for some, that's not their primary concern. For some, it's just the bottom line. And, um, you know, we've both experienced that to a greater or lesser extent, and it's not a nice place to be. Those are the funeral directors who give the funeral profession a bad name. And it's, it's sad to see. And, you know, occasionally we hear sort of anecdotes and stories from families we've dealt with about what's happened to them in the past or relatives. And it baffles me. There's easier ways to make a living. So mm. <laughs> why you choose to come into this just to make a profit, I don't know. Claire mentioned your website earlier, but I think, you know, well done really on the website because it's it's clear that you see that as it being a resource it's not just a directory of information like a way of contact it's a resource it's like here's what you need to think about here's what you need to do here's the process that you might need to consider walking through here's how we can help you know 24 hours a day here's our number a few times it mentions that yeah we quickly learned that people these days will go straight to the internet for example if a family member is poorly they're likely to pass away it's easier to click onto the internet than it is to actually speak to a person. We've stepped it up. We've got a little chat thing on the internet that Chris mans, and people will look on the website and then perhaps type something into the chat, and then Chris will have a conversation with them. It just makes them feel a little better. Then they, they're armed with the information from the website. They've had a little chat. They then feel confident enough to come in or, or to phone us up. It's a, it's a huge sort of platform that's easy for people to use, that doesn't have that terrifying, oh my goodness, I've got to go to a funeral director. I've got to speak to a funeral director. You know, it, it's been a, an enormous boon for us. Funeral directors, traditionally, we just didn't have websites. We didn't have any sort of technological things going on. And now we've we've turned that on the head, really. I mean, Facebook has been a massive, massive thing for us. We quickly had over a thousand followers on, on Facebook just telling people what we were doing, what was happening, the things that were happening, how, how the business was developing, and the interaction on there is wonderful. Uh, it really does fill you with, a, with joy. Social media can be a terrible, terrible thing, but we've had nothing but positivity from our Facebook page, our Instagram page. Our, our friend Ash, who, who helped us design it, we just will be forever grateful because he did such a good job of it. He's a, he's a pretty excellent chap he he put our ideas into fruition of, of how we wanted this to work and did a fantastic job of it great name as well for working with you in Undertaker <laughs> world, isn't it? You, you're gonna tell me you've got a colleague called doug next, don't you? <laughs> that's a good one i'm going to use that in the future with um obviously you're talking to a lot of people who are grieving and a lot of people do find that quite uncomfortable do you have any like tips or any ways that you train people coming into it or anything like that i know like you said being led by them is good and we found that a lot as well so some people will say i don't use the d word and other people will say my son my husband died and that's the language i use but is there any things in particular that you would say would help people feel a bit more at ease with people who are maybe grieving well Answering that from the point of view of someone who isn't a funeral director, who has perhaps had a, a neighbour who's suffered a bereavement. And quite often I'll hear that families who have dealt with, they'll say, oh, I, I saw such and such, I saw my neighbour yesterday and she didn't want to know. She, she sort of looked the other way and, as you say, in effect, crossed the road to avoid the situation. Because a lot of the time people just don't know what to say. You know, they, they don't know what to say and they think that if they say something, they're going to make it worse. Well, and and you, you, I mean, you could do, but you can't really make it any worse than what they're going through. And I think bereaved people are aware that any comments that they get or any interaction they have from friends or neighbours or whoever that may be is ultimately well-meaning and it's coming from a, a good place. So even if it is literally just I'm sorry to hear, then that's enough. And it doesn't have to be any deeper than that. It's just an acknowledgement that, yeah, I, I know what's happened and I'm sorry. It, it comes from a good place. It's not anything other than well-meaning. And, and But people are frightened because they're worried about making a bad situation worse. And, and they shouldn't be. 
speak to people. It's not difficult, is it? Just speak to people about what what's upsetting them, what how they feel. You don't have to offer any solutions. Just talk to them. Yeah, it's just that get just just some experience, and, and really important for for those in those professions who don't see the other side of the aftermath of what happens. So one of the things that we used to do is we would have a, a trainee doctors come and spend a day or two days with us so that they could see what happens when their work doesn't work out, when things go bad, when the worst thing can happen. And coming to a funeral director, spending time, hospice nurses do it with us as well, spending time here with us, they get to see the other side of it. So from a funeral director's point of view, starting out shadowing an experienced funeral director or coming and doing some work experience, actually being in that situation, families are very open. You, you just say to them, look, I've got a trainee with me or I've got someone who's, who's coming into the business. Do you mind if they come and sit in? Families are usually quite happy for that for that to happen. One of the questions we ask all our guests is about whether they've they've really grappled with the question why, like why do these things happen? Does that come up in your jobs at all? Sort of like a kind of why am I doing this? But also why do all these bad things happen or any other format of why type questioning? Probably we we both learnt a long time ago and I'm sure most people are the same that you realise that bad things happen to good people all the time and there's no reason behind it at all. And, you know, we, we both learned that a long time ago, you know, and uh, I'm very grateful for to be in the position that I am. And I know that that can change tomorrow. I think it would be easier to understand certain things if I was a religious person. It would be easier to say, well, that happens because of this. As someone who doesn't believe in, in any sort of religion, um, initially it's quite hard to go, ah, uh, why is this why is this happening but you do as you get older you realize that it sounds flippant but it's just life isn't it that's that's our lives here on this planet bad things happen awful things happen i i do totally understand when people say you know it's the price that we pay for for loving someone is that loss when they're gone it is a, it's a kind of price that we we pay for it you know it'd be easy not to to have relations with people it would be easy not to speak to them to hide yourself away and all of those things. Um, but we don't do that. We're social animals, aren't we? We're human beings. We need those connections. And, and with those connections come loss. And that's the hardest thing. The thing is with loss and, and bereavement, it, it never goes away. You just learn to sort of adapt around it. Your life continues. And that's one of the things that people would often say to me, I wish everything would just stop. That life just sort of goes on around you when you're in that limbo of um, of your own loss, of your own grief, of your own bereavement. And as you both work around death all the time, you know, it's your job. You've no doubt had and will have friends, family that can't bear talking about death, thinking about death. How has your experience and your work maybe shaped or changed or evolved your own view of death, talking about it, thinking about it, planning for it? I think I, I'm, you know, I love the Victorian tradition surrounding the the funeral directing world. I love the ceremony. I love the, you know all the things that we do, the vehicles, the the outfits, the hats, the canes. I I love all of that. It's not appropriate in every situation, but I do love that tradition. But there's also the tradition of we don't talk about it. It's not something you speak about. And and I've been a huge proponent really of saying no. We really need to. Because if we don't speak about things, they're just going to manifest and become infinitely worse. I have very few members of my family or friends who aren't absolutely fascinated and want to know every detail of what goes on. I've rarely come across someone who will go, oh, I can't. You know, occasionally when you're, you're driving through town in the hearse in a, in a funeral procession and you'll see people look away or you'll see people hide their eyes. But it's quite it's quite rare these days. Most people are absolutely fascinated by what we do and what happens. And we're open. You know, you can turn up here and we'll happily show you around, including behind the scenes. You know, obviously there are rules and regulations and appropriateness with regards to people who passed away. But the actual firmament, the infrastructure here, we're happy to show you around. You know, we want people to come in and, and demystify that that world. I think funeral directors are guilty of keeping this 
air of we don't really want you to know what's going on behind the scenes. And that doesn't help those who don't want to talk about it. It really doesn't. But that's changing as we become more open. And a lot, a lot of funeral directors now are far more open than they've ever been. I mean, when I first started, some of the things we do now would just be horrific. Goodness me, you know, the old school funeral directors would spend their time tutting and pointing their fingers and, and, and saying, you can't do that. You know, it's always been done this way. And the idea is, well, let's change it. Yeah, things are changing. Certainly the, the funeral profession is changing and people's attitudes to the funeral ceremony. We've seen big changes to towards direct cremation, for example. That, I think is probably one of the, the biggest change we've seen in the profession over the last couple of years is this in, introduction of a cremation without a service. It's, it's sort of just, no, I don't want any sort of funeral ceremony at all i just want to be taken to the crematorium and that's it we've really seen an introduction and, and a, that grow over the last couple of years sort of green funerals as well and uh, you'd have to be careful with that how do you de define green because someone's definition of green is very different to another but certainly the introduction of sort of wicker coffins and so on and so forth natural burial sites there's a couple of natural burial sites here in north wales which we look back 15, 20 years, we would rarely visit them. Rarely, rarely would be there. Whereas now we're there sort of three, four, five times a year, you know, whereas before it was once every couple of years, if that. So there's, there's big changes. We were quite lucky because a member of, of staff who works for us also has her own business and her background is woodland burials. And again, I don't want to use the word green funerals, but that sort of background and she very much opened our eyes to the sort of how this can work and, and we embraced it the same with direct cremations most funeral directors are horrified by this idea and that's purely a, a financial decision we embraced it and turned it on its head a little bit by still offering all of that but saying to the families look come and spend the evening the night before with your family member in our um, we don't have a chapel as such we have a front room here so we, we're very different in, in, in as much as you, you come to our funeral home and it is our home. You know, it's, it hasn't got that stigma of, of a chapel as such. It's just convenient to call it a chapel. Spend the evening, bring your family, have a drink, celebrate the person who, who's going the next day. We offer that to everybody who wants a direct cremation. And a lot of people will say, no, we don't want to do that. Dad decided that he wanted this very simple goodbye so we honor it but some people have said yeah you know what let's do that we don't charge for it we're happy to be here with people they work their way through our whiskey and our our uh sherry <laughs> quite quickly but well, that's fine that's all part of it you know it, it is all part of it and i think allowing them that time to say goodbye to do their own thing to perhaps say a few words makes the blow of not having a funeral uh a little easier to bear there's something I found really sad in a way, and it's, it's nothing to do with me and what people choose, but that direct approach. Because I think so much of, I think what Claire said to me in the past about funerals being for the living, in a sense that, you know, yes, you want to respect the wishes of the person that's saying, this is how I'd like to be remembered. But actually, you know, those who are left alive, they're the ones that need to have the ceremony, the farewell, the party, whatever it may be for them to acknowledge. And we see cultures around the world where, They'll spend days, if not weeks, in, in a period of mourning. Claire and I really valued the time of state mourning that we had after the Queen died because we thought it was so divisive in this country. But we thought fascinating to see this sort of forced period of, look, this is a time where we nationally recognise loss as opposed to just quickly brushing it under the carpet and moving on. Mm. So I think just for me, that, that thought of that sort of direct approach just takes away the opportunity for those who are still alive to spend time, to sit in the grief, to recognise that together. Yeah, it's, t it's tough. I've done a bit of a 360 on that myself. I No, 360 would be wrong, wouldn't it? I'd come back to the same place. 180. <laughs> I've done a 180 on it. I, I was very much, before we started the podcast, of the opinion of like, you know what, I just don't want to do any more funerals. i have been to funerals of lots of different ages. They always come too late. Like, you're just getting over, getting sad about something, and then you've got to dredge it all up again for the funeral. You know, the whole thing, I was like, I'm not sure. And then having done this podcast, I've completely gone the other way and just sort of thought, no, I can, I can see the value in allowing yourself to grieve at that point as hard as you need to, because otherwise, if you don't, it can be a bit complicated further down the line. 
Yeah, we, we often come across families who are very conflicted and, and not just with direct cremation. That's a, a sort of easy example to use that they are caught between honouring what their father, mother, whoever it is who's passed away wanted and what they feel they need to have to help them. And even in more traditional funeral ceremonies where there may be particular pieces of music that they left instructions for and they aggressively disagree with that piece of music and they don't know how to get around it you know so we've 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 come up with all sorts of ideas to try and come to some sort of compromise with them really one once we um there was uh two sort of siblings who were at absolute war over a particular piece of music and one was no that's what dad wants and that's what he's gonna have and the other sibling was like well i don't want that piece of music and the way we got around it was that they, the family had two following cars behind the hearse, they had two limousines. So this particular piece of music, we actually played it in the limousine for one family member to listen to on the way to the church. So they were happy that they'd included it. The other sibling didn't have to listen to it and put up with it. So they were happy. And the, the rest of the arrangements were fairly straightforward. So, but uh, yeah, th- there's this, there's this real conflict between what I need for myself to get through this funeral and this is what they wanted and if I don't do that I'm letting them down. There's there's a reason isn't there that funerals exist. We need this as, as human beings. We need our say. We need our chance to say goodbye and yeah in a way direct cremation takes that option away from people and that's why we wanted to sort of step it up a bit and say look have something. I lost a friend a few years back, he died on New Year's Eve in um, New Zealand. And it was hard for all of us because he was cremated there. His ashes were brought back. But we, we had a sort of a goodbye ceremony. A hotel and a couple of hundred people turned up and we all shared stories and said, you know, we had speakers saying various things and telling each other you know, stories about his life and, and, and so on. And that was a that was really cathartic for people because they hadn't had that chance to to properly grieve and and so yeah you're right the, in a way direct forms of burial or cremation can take that away but a, a funeral director is there to help you with that is there to say look why don't we do this you can tell often with families especially younger families they're so conflicted they don't know what to do they need someone to say, well, what about this? Or what about that? Or maybe this would be a nice idea. Give them some ideas. You need to guide them much more. Well, once you've started to give them ideas, they start to come up with their own quite quickly. And, and a decent funeral director will help them facilitate that. And all of that helps them to deal with the loss, doesn't it? You know, it may be of interest to you both and others as well. We did an episode a few weeks ago with um, a woman in America called Lisa Cole Ruland, who lost her husband in a mountain climbing accident, and no body was recovered. So she spoke quite a lot about one of the biggest challenges for her was grieving the loss of her husband without any ritual, really, mess- missing out on so much of the ceremony tradition that society may sort of say this is actually a way of, of working through that grief. Really interesting to hear how important having a body to sort of say goodbye to is, and we take that for granted quite often. I mean, we've we've taken care of soldiers and people who've been in in dreadful accidents and so on. It works the same way that in some cases you can't allow families to come to actually physically see them. So we, we have to work about ways of doing that. So they'll often, we'll encourage them to come and sit with the coffin which is closed and still spend their time in a room, you know, with, with the person who's passed away. It's that not being able to hold a hand, not being able to kiss a cheek, you know, not being able to to see physically that those people have passed away. And I hate having to say to families, it's the worst thing for me. Look, you really need to consider not coming. It's almost as if you're taking away a few of the steps that you've put in place to help them. And that's really hard. It's the same sort of thing I could imagine, that there isn't a body. You know, um, yeah, very, very difficult. It must be awful for her. One of the things that we were trying to achieve with the podcast was to look at all these 101 different types of loss to see, can you find hope in every kind of loss? Is it possible? Or are there some griefs that are just too too awful? Um, I guess to work in your kind of environment, you need some kind of hope to get through the day or else it would just become a bit overwhelming. So where do you see hope in what you do? 
I think for me, what what gets me through the day is having the opportunity to make a difference and uh, to to make a, a real difference to the families that we come into contact with. If I do my job correctly and as diligently as I should do, then at the end of that initial process, I should be able to say, yes, I did make a difference there. I still know when I've dealt with certain families whose loss is so great that I feel that their life is now without any hope that they've lost. And, and usually it's adult children who have passed away. And, and it's, it's very, very hard for certain people just to, to see any light at the end of the tunnel. Their lives become totally about that person. And no matter what we do as, as funeral directors, as anyone who works in, in this area, celebrants or ministers or whoever, you, you just can't help. The despair is too great. So, I mean, the thought for me of losing one of my children, it fills me with terror. It, it just breaks this part of you that that sees the light at the end of the tunnel thankfully it's such a small minority many people are are able to sort of forge uh, a life without that person but some just aren't that really troubles me it really troubles me because i fear that if something like that happened to me that may be me that's the kind of thing that keeps you awake at night on the other hand like chris said this this ability to help people fills you with confidence and, and and a sort of happiness a fulfillment that you've done the right thing and and I see hope in in all manner of things I see hope in 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 the faces of so many people that we that we've helped because in the end in most cases death is just the natural process this is what we this is our natural process as human beings so there, there's always that light at the end of the tunnel for them but sometimes my late father used to say, as one door closes, another one shuts. <laughs> and I kind of, I think, um, I think I can understand that sometimes people, that that's people's lives. Sorry. No, yeah, no, well, okay. I'm just, I'm really fascinated by that, though, because that sort of almost implies that when these things happen to you and, and you get into that situation, because like you said, there's a, maybe a minority in, in that boat, that you can't help it. And a lot of the people we've spoken to, I think, who have found hope, I think would say they had to search for it yeah. and they had to find it and it wasn't easy. And so I'm just wondering now, even that is, is fascinating, isn't it? You know, are we the kind of people who would be without hope in that situation? And you can't do anything about it. That's just going to be how you go. Or is it possible to find it? It's like a whole other area I want to explore. It's something that I think for a lot of people, working through grief just doesn't happen naturally. And, and I think people think it, it will. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't. And as you say, you have to go and look for it. You, you, you know, It's something that you have to work out and work through. There's also that thought that sometimes people don't want to get through it. Mm. You know, they, they don't want, to, it's not about wallowing in grief or self-pity that, that that's doing them a disservice. It's almost a feeling of guilt if I don't feel bad today. If I don't feel bad today, then I am not honouring the person who's passed away. And, and they make a choice to stay in that place without sort of attempting to, to work through it. And you say, it doesn't just happen, you know, this, this sort of often wheeled out phrase that time is a great healer you know that doesn't automatically happen and for some people they don't want that they, they'd rather stay in that place yeah it's it's um it's this guilt isn't it it's you've had a bereavement someone has passed away but for a, a fleeting moment an hour of your life you forget and then it hits you again because you were busy doing something else it hits you again and that guilt of Oh my goodness, how could I possibly forget? How could I possibly go back to normal? A lot of people struggle with that one. I've, I've felt it myself. I've felt it myself, that, that guilt of going back to what we said, life carries on. Yeah, you'll be upset when I die, John. I, I won't, <laughs> Chris. You'll be I absolutely won't. beside yourself. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> We're just about um, but I'm going to put you both on the spot. Hypothetically speaking, Jonathan, starting with you, let's say some tragedies happened and you were taking care of Chris's funeral. What one thing might you do to have sort of a bit of it, like the last laugh? What one thing might you do at Chris's funeral to put your stamp on it? I'm I'm going to put him in his coffin upside down, face down. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> for Chris, um, I don't know. To be honest, it's something we've not spoken about. I think 
He'll probably have a direct cremation. Yeah, uh, I won't tell anyone, <laughs> and no one will. No one will come okay. to his funeral. Chris, uh, there you go. You're upside down. You're directly cremated. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no bother with his Jonathan's turn. Did you do his funeral? What would you do to put your stamp on it? Um, I'd probably subcontract it out to someone else. <laughs> 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 oh, low blow. Yeah, that's that's harsh. That's harsh. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to ask you is, do you still have Jamie Oliver visiting you? Because that's how we found you on the internet in the first place. Jamie's wonderful. So Therapy Dogs Nationwide, um, a friend of ours, does an awful lot with them. And Jamie, Jamie Oliver. The dog. The dog, yeah, who comes to visit. He's wonderful. He's a bit, he's quite young, so he's a bit flighty initially when he comes in. He gets gets very excited to see us. But when he has been here, it's made a massive difference. I mean, this dog knows that you are suffering. And he will come along and put his head on your lap and sit next to you. If there's any young children here, he'll play with them. It's a, such a good idea. I know they go into hospitals and hospices and, and things like that because animals have this ability to just take us away for a few moments. And Therapy Dogs Nationwide are just a brilliant charity. And, and I absolutely encourage any funeral directors, just get them in. Yeah, the other thing, going to um, one of the families that we know who we've dealt with, they lost a child, a baby. And um, we've tried to support mum and dad. They have been amazing. Chris looked after them, but the mum and dad have just been astounding. They didn't let the worst thing that can happen to a parent destroy their lives, and they just went out to help other people. And mum started making teddy bears. They're called hunter bears. Their little boy was called Hunter. And these teddy bears, she hand makes them, and therefore bereaved parents. The, the bears are made, they're the same weight as the child who, who passed away, They've got little heat pads in them, and they're just wonderful. Got one in the office, and just when you come in through the door, and everybody comments on it. And for every one that families buy, she makes another one that gets sent off to hospitals and places like that where where mums and dads are, are suffering that bereavement. Um, but yeah, we're talking about hope. Some people really do know how to see past the grief and create something wonderful. That's a great idea. I haven't really come across that before. Thank you. One last question, which is, what's your Herman? Well, what is my Herman? Coming back to, we've, we've touched on this a few times in the last uh, sort of hour or so, is people's attitudes to grief and how everybody's different. And there seems to be this traditional sort of model, or most if that's the right phrase, of the journey through grief. And you start at point A and you work through to point B. And you, you go through this sort of denial, anger, bargaining, etc., acceptance, and so on and so forth. And whilst, yes, that is true, the grieving process isn't linear. And people often think, well, I'm here today, and in a year's time, I need to be there, and in two years' time, I need to be there, and I'm going to go through this journey in a linear way, and I know in three years' time or four years' time, everything's going to be fine. And... My Herman would be, don't expect the grief journey to be linear. It's all over the place. It's a child's scribble of backwards and forwards, up and down. And um, when I've met people who I've perhaps taken a funeral for 18 months ago, they're, they're no further on in that journey than they were from the day that it happened. And then I can see them another six months and they're way, way ahead of where they thought they would be. And then they're back again. And it's it's backwards and forwards and up and down. So, so no, don't expect the grief journey to be linear. Mine's a saying that um, I think is really important when you are bereaved. And it's been really important for me the last few years. And, and I, I say it to myself an awful lot. And that is that you don't need to attend every argument that you're invited to, especially when you're bereaved or especially when you're suffering a loss or any sort of struggle, just let those things that you would usually argue about or disagree with people about, just let them slide over you. You've got enough on your plate. It's easy to lose your temper, to snap, to say the wrong thing when you are bereaved. So, And, and it's something I've had to, to learn quickly. I'm, I've always been a little bit loud in certain things um, it's made a huge difference in my life 
that I don't have to attend every argument I'm invited to. So that's my home. We hope you enjoyed listening to Jonathan and Chris as much as we did chatting to them. Maybe it's prompted some questions or thoughts of your own around what kind of funeral that you'd like for those grieving for you, rather than just what you wanted yourself. Maybe it's got you thinking about jotting down some ideas to help guide those planning your funeral. And if nothing else, we hope it's given you an insight into a job that deals with death, bereavement and loss on a daily basis and the toll that can take on those carrying out the work. To find out more about Jonathan and Chris, you can visit their website, lbnh.co.uk, or find them on Facebook as Lord Brown and Harty, and I'll put links in the show notes. And for more about us, the full list of 101 losses as it grows, tips on how to talk to the grieving, and more conversations like this with people who work daily with loss, visit our website, thesilentwhy.com. We're finishing this episode with a poem read by somebody else. Mm. Yes, one of our most faithful listeners and a regular supporter of the podcast through buymeacoffee.com link in show notes or with our social media bios <laughs> <laughs> sent me a poem that he had heard at a funeral a while ago and it was so perfect for the podcast I asked him to record it and send it to me and it's a great fit to end this episode not only does it come from a funeral but the man reading it has a gorgeous Scottish accent meaning we've got a bit of England Wales and Scotland contributing to this episode so over to the very lovely very Scottish and very talented John Cunningham who also has one of the biggest and nicest gardens I've ever seen. The Dash by Linda Ellis I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what matters most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. To be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash may only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you lived your dash? Mm-hmm.